Wax on, wax off. What's that movie? Karate Kid. That's right. Wax on, wax off. Um, great movie. Um, if you haven't seen it because you're too young, I recommend that you check it out. Maybe you're watching Cobra Kai, the uh, kind of the, the ongoing series based on it. But um, uh, I, I bring it up to begin today, wax on, wax off, is, um, is a story, Karate Kid's a story of, um, of a young man, Daniel, who's trying to learn karate. And um, he's found this great teacher, Mr. Miyagi. Mr. Miyagi is the one that's kind of showing him how to do these things. And um, it's, it's, um, it's a wonderful story. One of the things that, that's fascinating about it is that I, I think it, it has some kind of durability. Uh, people still kind of know it or resonate with it. It's gone through remake. It's gone through these spin-off series. Uh, it has some durability because I think inside it, there's, there's a little bit of truth. And great stories do tell truth uh, in some way or another because they, they are a, a shadow, if you will, of, uh, of the truth of the scriptures and the gospel. And so um, this, the story of the Karate Kid has continued. Uh, Karate Kid is about this boy named Daniel who moves to New, from New Jersey to California. And uh, as, a, as a new person in, in California, he makes a major mistake. Uh, and maybe you've made the same mistake in high school, but what he did was he dated the most popular kid's girlfriend, uh, who happened to be a karate champion. And that got him in trouble. Uh, so a new kid, you know, kind of coming in and taking over and uh, dating a, a girl that he should not be dating. And so what happens is he gets beat up one night. Uh, these guys jump him. All the friends of the, the karate champion find him, and uh, they, they, they come after him, and uh, they, they attack him. And this mysterious figure shows up and rescues him, and it turns out it's Mr. Miyagi, uh, who will uh, eventually become his karate teacher. Now, the reason I bring that up is that one of the things that we've been pointing out, I pointed it out last week, is that we study the scriptures, we learn the scriptures, we understand what they say, what their meaning is. But we never want to lose sight of the fact that the scriptures are actually trying to do something in us. Uh, and it's not always easy to understand what they're trying to do, but they're trying to do something in us. Um, Karate Kid's a great example of words that are spoken that don't immediately make sense. They don't make sense. They don't really shape immediately. So don't be surprised at times when you open up the word or you hear a sermon or a message or in a class and you can't say, how is God trying, what's God trying to do with these words? What's he trying to shape me with? You know, last week I used the illustration of sitting down at the kitchen table with uh, your family and mom says, there's no salt at the table. And we, I asked you, what is mom trying to do with those words? And um, there's a lot of things she's trying to do, but immediately she's probably saying, one of you should get up and get the salt and bring it to the table, right? Moms were like that. Um, moms were probably saying things like, pay attention to others before you kind of worry about yourself. So there's lots of layers and shaping going on with these words. Um, in our house, if you come late to the table, uh, my 96-year-old father-in-law says, we waited for you like one pig waits for another. Now he's trying to shape that, uh, the thing, he's like, don't be late to the table, right? Uh, and he's got his way of kind of getting that point across. Uh, today we're gonna be looking at Joshua 23, a little bit out of order. Dave will be back and we'll do Joshua 22, but he allowed me to kind of continue with the passage I had prepared. So we're gonna do chapter 23, and what I'd like to do is invite you uh, to open uh, to Joshua 23, and um, we're going to look at these 16 verses and ask ourselves, what is God trying to do in us? How is he trying to shape us? What is he trying to get us to think about, act on, be different perhaps? How is he trying to actually alter our lives and transform us? And so um, as we get ready to, to, to read through these verses, let me just point out a couple of things. And, and the one thing is really that I, I want to point out is that uh, there is a kind of there's no salt at the table moment in this chapter. And um, it's, it shows up three times. And maybe it'll help uh, frame what you hear when I read the chapter together. 
So um, the, the kind of no salt of the table statement assure, uh, shows up in verse 1. The narrator, the one who wrote Joshua and collected all the material, says, a long time after, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and here's that no salt of the table moment, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years. So ask yourself, why is that being said? Joshua was old and advanced in years. So the narrator says that. Then you get into verse 2, and Joshua, who has, they've summoned all of Israel and all of Israel's leaders together, in verse 2 says, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, now here's his no salt at the table moment. I am old and well advanced in years. So what's Joshua trying to do? The narrator said it. Now Joshua says it. I'm old and advanced in years. Now one more time at the end of this, this message that Joshua delivers in verse 14. And so Joshua is speaking, and he's been addressing all of Israel along with its leaders. And in verse 14 he says, And now I am about to go the way of all the earth. What's he trying to say? What's he trying to get across? What's he, what's he trying to do in you and me by repeating these, these concepts of I'm old, I'm advanced in years, I'm about the way to go uh, all the earth? What's he trying to do? So be thinking about that. What's, what's the word trying to do in you as you, as you listen to this? So let me read the, uh, the chapter and we'll come back and uh, take a little bit of time to unpack some of what is being said here. So this is Joshua 23, uh, verses 1 through 16. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, I am old and well advanced in years. And you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight, and you will possess their land, just as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore, be very strong to keep and do all that is, in, all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand or to the left that you may not mix with those nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. But you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations as for no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand since it is the Lord your God who fights for you just as he promised you. Be very careful therefore to love the Lord your God for if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you, make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you and you know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. For they shall be a snare and a trap for you a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off, the good, uh, off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. And now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that no one word have, has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. But just as all good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off the good land that the Lord your God has given you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land 
that has been given to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that shapes us, that alters us, that transforms us. We pray that we would be attentive, that we would be open uh, to all that you wish to do in us. Uh, give us attentive hearts and um, a willingness to, um, to think freshly and to ask tough questions of ourselves and of each other so that we might um, fully realize the grace you've, you've, you've poured out to us in your son's name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So sometimes when the word of God comes to us, it is not obvious how it's meant to shape us. And sometimes there are things that are being left out that are also somewhat hard to fully understand. Uh, when Joshua says, I'm old, what do you think he's trying to get us to think? Um, what, what's, he, what's he after? Well, the way I look at it, and maybe you can add to it and we can talk about it later, but the way I look at it is he's saying, These, this is probably the last time you're going to hear from me. This is all the opportunity I'm ever going to have to address you as a nation. And because this is the last moment, what I'm going to say to you is really, really important. So give it a good listen. Don't, you know, say, hey, another sermon from Joshua. You know, say, this is really, ultimately, my summary of what I want to leave you with. This is my legacy. This is what I want you to have. Uh, again, it's not always easy to understand, but it's possible to understand if the Spirit of God, we pull, call upon the Spirit of God to help us understand. So that's what we're about today. And to organize it, I want to organize it around um, three basic commands that are found in the text. Uh, the first of these is in verse 6. Uh, so the first of these has to do with um, uh, the Word of God, uh, the law of Moses. So if you look at verse 6, there's this command, be strong to keep and to do. Be strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside neither from it uh, to the right hand or to the left. Um, now, that is uh, a command that I think is really about, you know, stay close to the word of God. Um, make sure that uh, you know it. Make sure that uh, you are uh, holding on to it. Make sure that you're able to obey it. Make sure that it's in you. So that's verse 6. And it's really all about follow the guidebook. Now, the reason this is kind of interesting in terms of language, and we won't necessarily turn there, but you could later on, you could go to chapter 1, and this language was the kind of language that Joshua was given in chapter 1 when he was called to be the leader of Israel. Uh, he was given the same sort of thing. He, the, the addition was that he was to meditate on it, and the, but the word of the law should never leave him. And so he's saying, you know, how I have led you is how you could lead yourselves going forward. Is if, if you know the law, and if you know the law of Moses, and if you really let it inside you, you could, you could actually navigate uh, the rest of uh, the opportunities and the, the development of the land and the receiving of the inheritance God has for you. Now, one of the things that's left out in this chapter is kind of glaring. Whenever you think about leadership, and I do a lot of work with leaders and leadership ideas, um, there's a thing called leadership succession. Um, you go, have you he heard of the term leadership succession? Leadership succession is uh, just that, who's going to lead after you're gone? <laughs> so it's not a hard concept. Who's going to be in charge when you're, you know, in California or Florida or Texas, you know, living it up in your retirement? Who's going to do that? So less leadership succession. So the thing that's interesting here is that Joshua is basically giving his retirement speech, his, uh, his last farewell address. And uh, as he does that, he leaves out something. The thing that he leaves out is, who's going to be in charge when you're gone? What's the answer to that? Yeah, that's what I thought too. I wasn't sure either. But as I began to think about it, and I was trying to kind of puzzle over it, pray through it, and I began, why is there no successor? There was Moses, and then there was a successor, and in Joshua 3, there's a whole discussion about how God validated the leadership of Joshua, uh, just like he did Moses when they crossed the, the Jordan, and all of it took place there in chapter 3. But there's no successor name. There's no successor named. Um, here's kind of what I think is going on. 
I think Joshua is saying, are you willing to, as a nation, yes, you have judges and scribes and priests, but you don't need a person like me anymore. If the Lord is your Lord, if you submit to God, if you know the law of Moses, the succession is just know God through the word and you will be able to kind of navigate what's going to happen next in your life. You could be shaped just by knowing the law of Moses. You could have guidance. You should know what to do. Um, and we'll see how that works, right? <laughs> it may not work as well as uh, Joshua hoped it would work. But he's saying, you could do this. Because the way I led, you could live the way I led. And if you did that, it would be all right. It would be the same as, as me leading you. Um, so I can imagine a, um, a motto. Somebody stands up before Israel in the days of Joshua, and they may say something like this. You know, hey, thanks. to have you. Good to have you here at the gathering of Israel. Good to have you here today. We're uh, here in Israel. We are uh, all about helping people live, love, and give like Joshua. Because Joshua is kind of a model. He's kind of a model. Live, love, and give like Joshua. I mean, if we learn how he lived, we can model that and, and, and get there. And that makes even more sense to us as uh, you know, present-day Christians because Joshua, you know, probably know, um, if you don't, you will know that uh, Joshua is the Hebrew pronunciation. Um, the Greek pronunciation of Joshua is Jesus. Um, and uh, so there's a, there's a kind of foreshadowing and anticipation of who Jesus is in Joshua. And uh, what you learn is that if you learn the word, and if you let it shape you, and if you figure out what's all about, you can go into the land and inherit it, and you can live side by side with people who maybe don't, and certainly don't believe what you believe. They're pagan, pluralistic society. Everyone's got family gods and city gods and big gods for the entire countryside, and 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 you could live side by side with them, and you would be able to maintain your identity. In fact, he says that's really what it's all about. He says, I want, I want you, in verse set, uh, 6, he says, you know, be strong and hold on to the law of Moses. And then verse 7, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of their names. He said, don't buy into their ways of looking at the world. Don't do this. You know, live and love and give. Be like the people of Israel. Don't lose your identity. Well, that's pretty amazing, amazing stuff. Um, is it possible for you and I to go out into the world, to work side by side with neighbors who don't believe what we believe and don't know Jesus and don't know the faith, but increasingly we live in this pluralistic society? Is it possible for us to go out there and not be compromised, uh, to be able to actually kind of be that, that light and that salt in a dark world? Is that possible for us? Yes, it is. And Joshua believed it is. Is it easy? No, but is it possible? Yes. Is it going to require a kind of dependence on God and a knowledge of his word and an openness that said, hey, shape me, move me, alter me, uh, make me who you want me to be? Yes. In, the, in this chapter, Joshua talks a lot about, you know, don't buy into their, their, their faith systems. Uh, what they believe in are Id idols. Uh, don't compromise yourself. Now, we think about that, well, I'm not going to go to any idol worship services, so I should be fine. But I think what was happening was that in order to do the basic things in life, you always invoke the other gods. Um, in order to have a contract, you say, hey, listen, hey, Kevin, we have a contract. I know that you kind of worship uh, kind of uh, this little statue that you grew up worshiping at home and everything, and you like to have an oath. Uh, when we have contracts and we work together, I'm going to ask you to come side my house, you know. So I know that you want to do that. Well, what would it hurt? You know, I'll, I'll do a little bow to you and to your gods. And, and, you know, I'm a Yahweh worshiper, and I know that doesn't make sense to you. But anyhow, that's, that's what I'm... Let's, let's do that. And so we would have contracts like that. And marriages would even be more complicated. Like, you know, who are you bringing into our house? He doesn't even worship the the little statue that we carved out of wood here, and the rest, of course, we used for firewood, but still, you know, that's the God that we worship here. You know, you don't want to marry this, uh, this guy named, you know, you know uh, he's, he doesn't even have a, he, it doesn't make sense, this Zachariah guy, I don't want to do that. 
And so to just live in the land side by side, it required a willingness to be different, uh, to stand out. Not easy, not easy. Um, I think there's built in us, all of us, a kind of a, a natural desire to want to fit in, right? Does it, I mean, anybody feel some of that? Or I mean, all you have to do generally is just remember high school, right? And that desire to fit in. Um, my big moment was going into ninth grade. When I went into ninth grade, um, I had been part of a small Christian school with I had about 20 classmates, and that was it. But when I moved to ninth grade, I was going to be with the big school and the public school for the first time. And uh, I wanted to fit in really bad because I knew, you know, I probably didn't. And uh, how, how's that going to happen? So my, my big attempt to kind of fit in was to adjust my identity. Um, I'm, you know, a kid that just grew up with blue jeans and shirts, but I wanted to be cool. So I wanted to have fashion sense. Anybody ever try to have fashion sense? That's really hard. And if you haven't been around other kids to show you what you're supposed to wear, you just, in my case, just hanging out with the other Lutheran kids in my Lutheran school, none of us had fashion sense. You know, what would a, what would a Lutheran wear if they wanted to look stylish? And the answer is, we didn't know. There was no way to know. And so um, I studied the J.C. Penney catalog. <laughs> because it was kind of like my Law of Moses. It was like, okay, if I'm going to adjust, I'm, I, mean, I want to do what they did. And so I was at a time, I mean, this is way back in the Dark Ages, so this was like, you know, back when the Beatles were popular, and so it was way, way, way back there. And, uh, and in the J.C. Penney catalog, they had things like, they had, a, they had a shirt, a kind of shirt I had never seen before, but I was sure that public school kids wore. It was a Paisley shirt. Now, that was a little wild. Um, I bought my dad once a paisley tie. I inherited it when he died. <laughs> my mom said, you can have his tie. And I said, well, it looks like it was never worn. He said, it was never, she said, it was never worn. It was just too wild for him. So paisley was popular. And I thought, well, that's good. And I shouldn't have the drab Lutheran color, so I should have a bright color. So I wanted a bright color, so I had a, 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 a yellow, a blazing yellow paisley shirt. But it wasn't enough to have that. I wanted it to, um, I wanted to have a certain stylish flair. And so, because the Beatles were popular, they were popularizing a thing called a Nero shirt. It was a weird looking shirt because it didn't have collars. It didn't have button down. I mean, it made no sense at all. None of us had ever seen a shirt like this. But I saw it in the J.C. Penney catalog. It was a Paisley shirt with a Nero collar. And I go, wow, I'm going to wear that. And I talked my mom into buying it for me. And I said, Mom, um, I, think, I think that I need yellow pants to go with my yellow shirt. Yes, you can see where this is going, but I'm trying to fit in. I'm trying to fit in with all my effort because I want to be one of them. And that's an instinct that's in you. And so I came the first day of ninth grade and I had hush puppies because they were cool. You know, these suede shoes. And then I had yellow socks. And then I had yellow pants. And then I had a yellow Nero shirt. And... In ninth grade, you went from one class to another class. You didn't sit, sit in the same classroom. And that was stunningly different as well. And so I'm m making my way through the class, and the last class of the day was Mr. Chamberlain's civics class. And I'm thinking, this has been an amazing debut. I've really kind of nailed it. I felt super confident the whole day. It was just so cool. And I could see my classmates from the Lutheran school really saying, well, he nailed it, you know? And so I'm walking out, and I, I sense a couple of the girls are talking about me, and so I slow down as I exit the class just to maybe catch a piece of their conversation. And one is saying to the other, did you see the new kid? And I thought, yeah, she saw the new kid. And the answer from this other girl was, yes, I saw the new kid. He looks like a giant banana. with strange paisley designs. 
Now, I bring that up is that Joshua knows his warnings are about compromising your identity when you go into the world, and are you going to adjust your identity when you make contracts? Uh, are you going to intermarry where it's going to force you to actually bow down and, and evoke the names of false gods? Or are you going to follow the guidebook of Israel? Can you do this? Now, I, this, we're laughing about this, but I want you to understand how seriously difficult this is. How seriously difficult this is. You know, some of us know because we work in the world that has a lot of classes that want us to accept and affirm uh, all kinds of ideas and behaviors and identities. They want us to be both inclusive. Some of us know this language. They want us to be both inclusive and affirming. Have any of you heard the inclusive and affirming language? Have you heard that? Do you know what I'm talking about? You get a lot of that, right? Now, let me tell you, that's hard to navigate. I, I talk to men and women who are struggling in their faith and say, how do I fully navigate that? And I'm opening a can of worms, but let me just point out just something really simple. Jesus, the ultimate Joshua, was brilliant when it came to keeping the identity. In his sinless perfection, he was always who he was. He never abandoned. He lived by faith in the word. The word that he said is how you live. Uh, it's more important than bread. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is crucial. Here's what he was able to do. And here's what I think Joshua wanted his generation to be able to do. Jesus could be inclusive while not being affirming. Now think about that. And it doesn't take much to kind of delve into the Gospels. Jesus was inclusive, but he didn't have to be affirming. And this is what got him in trouble. This is what got him in trouble. Jesus is inclusive. Example. What did Jesus do that was inclusive? He ate with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes. Very inclusive. Kind of annoyingly so for the religious crowd. But he was able to be inclusive. But did he ever affirm them in their sin? No. It's a, it's a supernatural strength that only comes from those who call upon the shaping power of God and the Holy Spirit to be both inclusive but not affirming of sin to tell the truth, to recognize the truth, and to love people where they're at, and yet at the same time not compromise your identity. And Joshua stands before his congregation, and he says, when I'm gone, he's, most commentators say that Joshua is about 109. He dies at 110, so he's got a year of life left. He's an old, aged man, and he stands before you. Follow the guidebook. It's all that I ever did when I led you. Don't turn to your left or your right. Just go, just follow the guidebook. And it'll be crucial because you'll be tempted to be accepted. You'll want to dress up the way everyone else dresses up. You'll want that so badly, and I get that. But follow the guidebook. Follow the guidebook. And eventually we're going to see that Jesus is saying, yes, love the lost but don't affirm them in their lostness. And if you have any encounters like that at all, you know how difficult that is. How dependent we must be on, on God and His Spirit and the body and the wisdom that we can accomplish is so, so crucial. So the first, the first big piece here today is just, you know, if you're going to dare to be a Joshua, if you want to live, love, and give, like Jesus. I could live as long as I could modify living and make it kind of look like everybody else. I could love like, uh, you know, I could love all people consider me loving. I could give maybe a little bit that's harder for me, but live, love, and give. But when we add the last words like Jesus, that blows the whole thing up. You know, our world would be happy for us to be livers 
lovers and givers. <laughs> but like Jesus, <gasps> that's where the rub is, and that's where the wisdom is, and that's what Joshua's saying. I get the temptation, follow the guidebook. All right. Second, second, um, second command that I want to bring you to. So verse 6 has, you know, hold fast, be strong, and hold fast. Now, in verse 8, in verse 8, a second major command that we can organize a lot of what Joshua says around. And in verse 8, uh, but you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you've done to this day. And he points out again that this is absolutely crucial. Uh, you've seen it work already, just as you've seen the Lord work for us and fight for us and, uh, and give us power and go before us. You shall cling. All right. Let's talk about clinging. Um, that word clinging, that word to cling, um, uh, we see it early on in the book of Genesis. Uh, some of you might even guess where we see it. We don't normally in the King James world that I grew up in say cling. We said cleave. Uh, a man shall cleave to his wife. Um, and we see it in the book of uh, Ruth because Ruth uh, clings to Naomi, her, her mother-in-law. Uh, and so we see it as, as, as a willingness to, to hold tight to another person and fully identify with them uh, and, and have intimate connection with them and to really believe that your life and identity is so wrapped up in this other person that you don't dare let go. Now, some of us have small children uh, out there. Some of us once were small children. Uh, most of us were small children. Um, some of us were, okay. But anyhow, all of us were that. And, um, and sometimes when you, you know, like I like to kind of greet small children and greet them, and I've got grandkids, and so they're three years old, two years old, and you try to make friends with them, right? Oh, what's this one's name? Oh, this one's name is John. Hey, John. And what does John do when the strange weirdo like me kind of reaches out to them? What will they sometimes do? They'll cling to their mothers, right? Uh, dads sometimes, but especially mothers. And they're going to cling to them, and they're not going to let go of them. And, um, and then lots of times mothers will say, well, normally he's uh, very comfortable with people, um, but for some reason um, he's, try he's being shy today. That's, not, that's the nice way of saying you're being a little weird. <laughs> I've learned this. I get this. I'm a little coming on too strong here. You're being a little aggressive here. You're being a little too weird. This kid's scared. Leave him alone. But I'm going to say it in a nice way. He's just being a little shy today. All right. And I'll accept that. So, but why does a child instinctively do that? Because they know where safety is. They know where, uh, they know, uh, where uh, when times get tough that they have to cling. And that clinging is... Uh, getting really, really close. Now, it's not to a book that they cling, it's to the Lord that they cling. It's really, really important to understand. Um, again, so easy to look at the word and treat it like a rose that you dissect. Remember, we have to kill to dissect. Um, we don't want to lose the life of the faith that we have because it's the Lord, it's a personal faith. It's a faith in a personal God who speaks to us, who relates to us as human beings and has relational dynamics with us. It's not a thing. Christianity is not a thing. We don't study a thing. We study, well, we receive the word spoken to us by a person who loves us more than we could love ourselves. And we cling to him because we know that it's a relational dynamic. Now, my unbelieving friends, when I talk about, you know, Christianity's not a, a performance-based religion, it's a relationship. You know, maybe you've had this happen. Do people say, when you, when you say, well, it's a relationship, and they go, what are you talking about? That's weird. That's just weird, weird, weird. I don't get it. And it's kind of hard to get if you've kind of grown up as religion is performance, is the thing you do. Um, you know, we just, you know, mom and dad brought us, kind of went through the motions. We endured the sermons. Thank you. Uh, um, all of those things. And yet it's clinging to a person. 
I don't fully understand that, but I know it is the truth that this is a personal relationship with the maker and creator of the earth and his son Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. I know that it is profoundly intimate and relational. And that language was really hard for me to buy into because I wanted it to be analytical. I wanted it to be informational. I wanted it to be propositional. It's all of those things, but not less than a relationship. I wanted it to be something I could kind of keep at a distance. And what, what Joshua is saying is that when you give yourself to the word of Moses, don't lose sight of the fact that you're clinging to the God of creation. Don't lose sight of that. Because that's where your safety and identity will be. Really, really crucial to understand. Lots of times when we sing choruses, as a person who's kind of relationally backward, me, I'm going, does everyone else feel the love of Jesus? Because I just don't know how to say this sometimes. I'm not really sure it's really, really real. But I want it to be real. And I think that it will be real if I don't give up, if I keep coming back, and I find the Lord deepens my capacity for human relationship with others while he deepens my capacity to have relationship with him. Stunning. Joshua says, let's not lose sight of that. It's going to keep us from uh, giving in, and it'll keep us uh, from losing sight of the power of God. Now, the last of the commands, uh, verse 11 um, these are the ones I think are highlights that I'm picking. Now, there's more to be said here. But he says, um, Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. Oh, my. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. Oh, love showed up. Huh. The day before Valentine's Day. Well, it's probably about something more than plagues, right? As Jane taught us. Something, it's about love. And um, what is that? What is love? Um, if you pause for a moment and you think about it, is love an emotion? It has affections and emotions associated with it. But here's something that really struck me years ago. If love is an emotion, how can it be commanded? It's like saying, I'm going to pick on Kevin because it's fun and he's right there. I mean, it's an easy target. Second one times a day, and, you know, Kevin. Um, be sad. It's like saying that. It's like commanding emotion out of him. Be ecstatic. Uh, how's he going to pull that off? If it's a pure emotion to command an emotion, how does that work? Um, and, and here's what I think is the dynamic of love. Love is, um, love can be commanded because it's a decision you can make. You can choose to direct your affection and love at a person. And that's what we do in marriage, that's what we do with our children. We, we actually do that in weird ways all the time. Um, I'm betting Dave's watching right now. How many? You know, I'm betting he's watching. He has chosen a weird thing to love. He has actually, I mean, it's not Clarissa. No. It's not the kids. It's not you. It's the Cubs. <laughs> and we all know it. And he could have chosen to love the Cardinals. He could have chosen to love, you know, uh, you know this drum set or this guitar. He could have chosen to love all, you know, but he chose to love the Cubs. He has strange affections for them. But because he chose that, the affections followed on. They didn't precede, they came afterwards. And so for whatever reason, early on in life, he got into a place where he chose to love the Cubs. And then all of his affection followed over the years. And it grew until he became very strange. I love the Cornhuskers. I get the strange thing. I understand that. 
So let me tell you a little bit about this love as a decision you make. Um, let me illustrate it with uh, working out. Since we're still in the new year, you know, January, February, um, pretty soon you'll be able to get on a machine across the street at the YMCA, easy. But uh, that usually lasts to the end of February, and then, you know, it's gone. So let me, let me talk about um, maybe getting in shape or losing weight. Um, you say to yourself, I want to get in shape. No, and everyone's going to say, yeah, that's a good thing, do that. You know, no one's going to say bad idea. They're going to say good idea. So um, what do you do? You go, you get yourself a membership. And um, you go and uh, maybe you get a trainer or maybe you just kind of start lifting weights and getting on the treadmills and things like that. And you go and you work out for an hour. And then you come home and you look at the mirror. And you go, I don't see any change. Where's the change? I was hoping for more, all right? So you say, well, I just didn't do enough. <clears throat> and so you think to yourself, I've got to do more. And so you say, I'm going to go, I'm going to work out for two hours. I'm going to go from an hour to two hours. You come back to the mirror the next day, I don't see any change. There's no change. What's going on here? I'm, on Saturdays, I'm going to work out for five hours. And so you do Thursday, Friday, now it's Saturday, and I'm going to do five hours. I get on the machines and I start lifting, and I come home and I go, I don't see any change. Right? Now, how does it work? It doesn't work that way. You choose to work out for 20 minutes on Thursday, and you come home and no change. You uh, choose to work out on Friday for 20 minutes, and you see no change. You do it on Saturday and Sunday. Pretty soon you've got 30 days in a row, and you see no change. But what's going to happen if you keep doing it that way? If you choose every day to work out, a year from now, you're going to go, well, there's the change. There's the change. So that's how love works. You say, I'm going to love the Lord. And I go, well, I don't feel a lot of change, and people don't see a lot of change. Yeah? Do it one day, the next day, the next day. You don't see a lot of change. But you choose day over day, year over year, and you start seeing the change. This is that, that fall in love with the process, and the process will love you back. Fall in love with the Lord. Joshua knew this. Fall in love with the Lord and make that decision every day to spend time in the Word, to pray, to kind of connect with fellow believers, to kind of open yourself up to the change. And you may not see a lot of change, but you will see change. Because sometimes it's dramatic, I grant you that, but most of the times it's just slow, determined change. I love Mexican food. How did I learn to love Mexican food? By eating Mexican food. I, don't, I, I hated Mexican food. I was sure I didn't like it. But that's all my wife fed me for a while. And day after day, something changed to me where now if you ask to go out for lunch, I'll say, let's go to El Rodale on Douglas for some Mexican food. You're going to learn to love the Lord by loving the Lord. Day in and day out. Oh, man, so much here. What time is it? Oh, I've gone too long. Um, <clears throat> verse 14, verse 14, verse 14, <clears throat> to wrap things up, there's another theme in this, um, in this chapter. And so we've seen, you know, follow the guidebook, the law of Moses, cling to the Lord, love the Lord. These are my last words, listen closely. Verse 14 is a great summary though. He says, and now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. So he's again restating what I've been saying. And he says, you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. If you read these 16 verses and look for the word promise, you'll see it several times. 
Because woven into this is this absolute certainty that God's word won't fail you. His word won't fail. Inside this message is the statement, the Lord is faithful. Great is his faithfulness. His promises are sure. Live, love, and give like Joshua. Do what I did. And you'll be able to live in the land and receive the blessing. So, let's pray and we'll close with song. Father, thank you for the message of Joshua. Help us to, uh, to hear what you want to do and be shaped by your loving grace and kindness. In Jesus' name, amen.